If you could have a do-over and start your farm all over again from scratch, knowing what you know today, what would you do differently? In today's episode, I'm interviewing a special guest, one of my Accelerator students, and he's going to talk through some of the mistakes he made in his first two years, the things he wished he'd known and that he'd try differently. He's got a ton of wisdom and gold to share today. I can't wait for you to hear it. Let's get started. Hey there, this is Corinna Bench, and welcome to the My Digital Farmer Podcast. In today's market, it's not enough to just grow your product. You've got to know how to sell it, too. Welcome to the My Digital Farmer Podcast, where we reveal online marketing strategies and tips to help farmers like you get better and more confident at marketing. Learn how to find more customers, increase your sales, and build a strong brand for your farm. Let's start the show. Well, welcome to episode 204 of the My Digital Farmer podcast. I am your host, Corinna Bench, one of the farmers at Shared Legacy Farms out in Elmore, Ohio. I'm also the founder of MyDigitalFarmer.com, which is all about trying to help other farmers get more confident in their marketing and sales strategies so that you can grow a profitable business. Welcome to the show. A big shout out to all of my regular listeners. Welcome back. I'm glad you're here. And if you're new to the show, thanks for checking it out. Make sure you go and subscribe to the podcast and go listen to my first 10 episodes. They were designed to be an on-ramp into the marketing lingo. So if you're feeling a little green and lost, that is definitely the place to start. I explain all of the foundational principles. Another place to go is to reach out to me and get onto my email list because when you do, I will share with you about three months worth of weekly emails that drip out kind of the marketing 101 that you need to know to get started. So I've curated the best of my resources and other people's resources, and I share them with you over the course of those emails. And by the end of it, you're going to have a really great place to start. You can subscribe to that by going to mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash subscribe. Today's podcast is sponsored by Local Line. Have you heard about Local Line's connections feature? This feature is game-changing for farmers who sell and aggregate products from other producers in their communities. Selling other producers' products on your local line storefront works two ways. First, through managed products. You can create profiles for your vendors on your local line account and assign products. You have control over inventory, pricing, and availability. Or through connected products. Farmers who already use Local Line can share selected products with you for your store. Connected vendors have control over shared products. With connections, not every vendor has to be the same. This system allows you to add, edit, and remove vendors and products seamlessly. It's never been easier to become a one stop shop. Farm e commerce made easy. Become the grocery store replacement in your community today. Check out connections and many more of Local Line's features today. If you sign up for a local line account using my coupon code MDF2023, you can get a free premium feature for a whole year. Go to mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash local line. And don't forget to use my coupon code MDF2023. And now back to the show. So we are at the end of March. It's hard to believe that it's spring already. I feel myself shifting my focus and my energy more and more towards the farm. So in the wintertime, I usually get to take about three months off and focus on Digital Farmer really well and take some time to be with my family and rest and recuperate. And now I find myself ramping up the energy, shifting my attention over to my CSA and my online store sales in the preseason. And my accelerator students, so my small group coaching program for farmers, is finishing up our first month of our cohort. And we just wrapped up our email nurture sequence project. So that was the job this past month to build that particular marketing asset for their business and some of them already had it in place and they were kind of tweaking it. Most of them though were building it from scratch for the first time 
And I'm really proud of all of them for working on it. This is a, in my opinion, a pretty powerful thing to have in your business. Because the minute I added it many years ago, it was actually one of the first things I built. I immediately noticed that I started having higher open rates and I had customers who were ready to purchase for me because they had gone through this process of opening those nurture emails and connecting with me and learning my story and reading funny stories and getting tips and all kinds of goodwill stuff. So it really is a helpful process and um, I'm glad that we were able to add that into our farm marketing school. Next month, the Accelerator students, we are working on optimizing the homepage of our website. So we'll just be really focusing on all the messaging that's on the homepage and what can we do to dial that in better. So if you're interested in learning more about Accelerator and how you can join this small group, there's only a um, little over 15 of us in this group, and you want to know how do I get in there, um, you have to get on the wait list. I'm not going to be opening it up again until the early fall, but you can go to mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash coaching to read up about it and see what's all included, how it works, and then get on the wait list there. So in today's episode, I'm actually interviewing one of the farmers that is in the Accelerator program. His name is Glenn Young, and Glenn is so enthusiastic. You're going to pick up on that big time in this interview. He has such a can-do attitude. And what I love about him is that he's a doer. He has a bias for action. And when I first met him, he just wanted to suck my brain dry and be like, what are you doing? What's working for you? And then, you know, he went out and tried to replicate that and he just took action and he's seeing progress step by step. It's so exciting to work with someone like Glenn. He actually left his day job. He quit his day job. He started farming, farming carbon at his farm, Cold Springs Organics, and he believes in his heart that the world is going to be a better place if there's just one small farm for every hundred families. And you will hear him tell that story and you're going to hear his passion that's driving his business. Now, Glenn has made all of the mistakes possible, and he will be the first to tell you this in his first two seasons of organic market gardening. Um, he's built up to a 40 member CSA and a once a week farmer's market operation. And he has literally bet the farm on making Cold Springs Organics environmentally and financially sustainable. And he has a deep rooted interest in seeing other new farmers do the same, which is why I love having him in our accelerator group because he is so interested in pouring into all of the people that are in the group and really helping them get excited about this mission as well. So we're gonna discuss all of the sales and marketing things that have worked in his business over the last Last two years and what he would do differently if he were to have a do-over for those first two years on the farm. I think you're going to find this conversation to be really enlightening, especially if you are a CSA farm. Today's guest is Glenn Young. He is the farmer and owner of Cold Springs Organic, just outside of Toronto, Canada. Glenn has a background in engineering and worked for 15 years in information technology. During that time, he built enough of a real estate portfolio to semi-retire and spend a lot of time with his young boys. He and his wife, Amy, welcomed a new baby girl in 2016, and baby Grace's birth really opened Glenn's eyes to the risks of climate change and problems with the industrial food system. So Glenn found a friend and an investor to help him form a joint venture and buy some farmland and start farming carbon. His goals are to make the farm an example for sustainability. And to accomplish this, he's been racing to make it financially sustainable. They've grown from a revenue of $7,000 in year one to 40 k in year two and have to double again next season to get into the black. Glenn will share what has worked and what hasn't worked in his first two seasons, along with his priorities for next season. Glenn lives with his amazing wife, Amy, and three children just east of Toronto, Canada, and always loves to connect with other small-scale farmers or aspiring farmers in the area. Please join me in welcoming Glenn Young to the show. Well, Glenn, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to have you. Uh, you are one of the star members of Accelerator and you always get stuff done. So I'm so glad you're here. Would you tell my listeners about your farm business, how you got started, just kind of an overview, location, how many acres, marketing outlets, stuff like that? Yes, definitely. So my name's Glenn Young and I'm the farmer at Cold Springs Organics. Uh, we're going into our third season right now. And I mean, it's funny because 
I grew up in the country and I worked on a dairy farm as a kid. And I came out of that thinking I never, ever wanted to be a farmer. Uh, so I did the sensible thing. I studied engineering. I got a job in IT and I spent a long time working at a desk. Along the way, uh, got married, had two boys and then a girl. And when my daughter was born in 2016, I really started to think about how we were treating the earth and what kind of future we were leaving for our kids and our grandkids. And that got me researching climate change. And I started a permaculture project in my backyard with a Hugo culture bed and neighbors were asking if I had buried bodies in there. And I realized <laughs> that uh, farming carbon was the best thing that I could do to help draw down our greenhouse gases. And I also realized that the world would be a much better place if we had one small farm for every 100 families. Uh, so I began the search for a farm. And I have a friend who's passionate about this mission as well. And he decided to invest with me as a silent partner. So we started Cold Springs Organics in 2020. Uh, in terms of location, we're about an hour uh, northeast of Toronto. So near a big center, which is great. It's a beautiful property with a very special history, 105 acres of rolling uh, hills and virgin forest, uh, nice spring fed creek going through. Now I'm only actively farming about an acre of certified organic uh, vegetables right now. We grow a mix of 45 different crops like many other CSAs. Uh, our market outlets are, uh, we have a 40 member CSA last season, uh, over 18 weeks from middle of June to middle of October. And we did one farmer's market. In terms of gross revenue, and it's worth mentioning that I'm Canadian. And so these numbers are, you know, there's 75 cents US buys a, a Canadian dollar. So our numbers Canadian are 7,000 revenue in year one, and then 60,000 revenue in year two. And the mix is about 60% CSA, 30% farmer's market. So we're making a little over $1,000 per week. And then uh, 10% on rent, on farm events, a little bit of wholesale. Uh, my target for year three is 100,000. And I think it's also worth for people listening, uh, me mentioning profitability. So unless I can exceed my goal of 100,000 revenue this season, then there's no wage for me. So that's something to bear in mind for people starting. Uh, the biggest expense is labor. Uh, last season in our second season, I, I started with three staff. I lost one uh, shortly into the season, so we finished out with two. And uh, for next year, I'm actually planning to uh, do a mix of local workers and uh, two temporary foreign workers as well. So I'm going through that process. Uh, so that's pretty much our farm. I love how you shared kind of those percentages and even some numbers, because I think when you're first starting a business as a farmer, you actually don't even know what the benchmark is. You kind of head to the farmer's market and you're like, what am I even supposed to make? Like, what is the going rate? And <laughs> um, and so that's super helpful to kind of hear um, some of that feedback. I want you to tell us about how your business has morphed over time. Because one of the reasons I wanted you on the show today is because you've only been doing this for two years and because you're such a go-getter and you have been building it very methodically. And I want you to tell this story in, in light of like, what are the milestones that you hit? What were some of the things you tried, the things that bombed, the things that surprised you, the things that went really well, so that a new farmer can kind of see like, here's the stuff that this is the, the normal trajectory or what you should expect and the things you should maybe work on. Cause I think you're a really good example of that. So how, wherever you want to start, like just how, how did this business get going and how did it morph? Yeah, I'm happy to share that because like I said, I really hope that there's other people out there that hear this and it helps them to be successful. Cause like I said, I feel like we need a lot more small farmers. So uh, let me tell you what I did, and then let me tell you what I would have done if I were to go back to year mm. zero and start over again. Mm. So uh, right out of the gate, I had a really aggressive business plan. So I was targeting 7,000 revenue in season one in Canada. You have to hit that number in order to get your property tax uh, credit. So you get three quarters off your property taxes if you're a, a real farm, quote unquote. Uh, and I seemed like I thought that was a really reasonable amount. Uh, and then all the way up to season five, I'm targeting to be making 200,000 in revenue. Because it's so aggressive, I had to plan to pull things in as early as possible. So even from the point that we had just agreed to purchase the farm to the 
point that we were closing on the farm, I built a lot of things into our purchase agreement that allowed me to do work before we closed on the farm. And people can even be more aggressive with this, but we built a test pond on the property before we purchased it. Uh, we visited with uh, organic consultant to get the organic certification process underway. Uh, we got a permaculture designer to come in and help us figure out how to work with the uh, fields that we wanted to plant in and design our swales and flowering hedgerows and everything. Once I closed on the farm, I already had plans in place for irrigation, greenhouse, our wash and pack. We, as soon as we closed, we built those swales in the South Garden. Um, and I think people could do a lot more. So it's something to keep in mind. In 2021, which was my first season, uh, it was hard to do, but I limited myself to 10 crops. And again, you know, this is just uh, difficult for a new farmer, uh, but I knew that I needed to focus on getting my infrastructure built. I had to build an irrigation system from scratch, a greenhouse from scratch, a wash and pack station. Uh, so I didn't want to go overboard on the crops. Uh, the sales target of $7,000 seemed really reasonable to me. And it was only when I planted my first 100 feet of radishes and they were ready to be harvested that I realized how much I had overlooked sales and marketing. Uh, you know, radishes don't sell themselves. And <laughs> if you want to become a good salesperson and you get good at selling radishes, then I think you can sell anything. My sales were super ad hoc that first season. We were, it's not like I have anything against radishes, by the way. I love radishes, but they are hard to sell. I, I would be texting and emailing friends whenever I had stuff available, like try and text your friend and see if they wanted to buy a bunch of radishes off of you. And then I would ask them to text their friends. And so really trying to leverage my network was my approach and wasn't the best. I'll talk about what I should have done. Most of the season, I had no harvest schedule because, again, I was building so much stuff. And, and I guess it's worth mentioning that I'm by myself as well. I get a little bit mm -hmm. of help from the family here and there, but I'm mostly by myself in, in the first season, especially. And uh, so when I had the manpower and the customers, I would text everyone, I would harvest and I would, you know, deliver. Then luckily in the first year, I got a relationship with a trendy organic grocery store in the area. And I managed to get them to take some of my tomatoes and some of my products. You know, people didn't know me as a gardener or a grower or anything like that, but that gave me some credibility to get into that grocery store. The other thing that was a boon in our first season was we had an anniversary party at the end of the year, and that made about 20% of our revenue target. It gave us a great photo opportunity, and we got a lot of visibility, mm -hmm. and people connected with the farm at that event. So that was really good as well. So that brings us into 2022, and finishing the 2021 season, I knew that I had to go really big. I took your CSA Quick Start, which really helped me nail down my offer. It gave me, you know, basically a road map for how I would get ready to launch my CSA. Over that off season, I got my website built. I, I got basically all the tools you have, Corinna. I got local line, convert kit. I built my lead generator, which I'll talk about, my email nurture sequences. So when people signed up for emails, they were getting that sequence, uh, you know, five emails over 10 days or whatever it is. And then I also set up my onboarding emails. So every time I got a new customer, they would get a four emails, like led them into the crew, basically. I hired three staff going into that season. So that was, I knew I'm making a big investment and I started my newsletter. So I started to build my email list. This is only year season two, mind you. And I basically started from scratch. Uh, so I had zero emails. I purchased your uh, veggie storage guide, A to Z veggie storage guide uh, lead magnet. I set that up on my website. I did a lot of word of mouth advertising, a little bit of paid advertising on Instagram and Facebook. And by the end of last season, we got up to 200 email addresses. One of the good things I did was I, one of the three hires I made was really good at social media. And so I saw she had a big following right away and I made her my social media lead. And she went, you know, crazy on that. She loved it. And uh, basically over the course of last season, we went from 100 Instagram followers to 600 Instagram followers. Another interesting thing that we did, which is unusual, was, you know, I had planned to build a cooler. Uh, but instead of uh, building a cooler, I bought a secondhand refrigerated trailer, uh, which is basically this driving billboard. And the nice thing is we harvest the veggies in the morning, we keep them cool, they go straight into the cooler, they go right to the customer, they stay cool, you know, all the way till they get to the customer. 
And now it's got a big sign on the side of it, Cold Springs Organics and, you know, all of that. So it's a driving billboard for us. The other thing that I did, which I didn't want to do initially, was go to Coburg Farmer's Market. I really just wanted to focus on CSA. I felt like Farmer's Market was you know, an extra day of harvest, wash and pack, an extra day at the market. And I just didn't think that it was going to be core to us to get the revenue that we needed. But friends of ours were retiring organic farmers in the area, Gregory and Elena, and they talked me into it. And in the hindsight, I'm so glad that they did because it was really key to getting us a lot of visibility, right? In a, in, a new, in a new community, it allowed us to grow our Instagram following. They had, you know, 5,000 followers on Instagram. They would share everything we would share and tag them in. Uh, so we got great visibility, but also it was great for the kids. I mean, just that one season of farmer's market, all of a sudden my kids are all entrepreneurs now. Like they literally are just, they figured out how business works like overnight, mm-hmm. essentially which is so interesting to see. It, it allowed us to sell our extra product as well. You know, the CSA takes the core, but then you bring the other stuff to farmer's market and it gave us a big chunk of revenue, you know, over a thousand dollars a week in revenue. So the last thing I did at the end of last season was I took your early bird campaign course, which worked really well, like building the, uh, the visibility and the excitement at the end of the season and then launching the sales for the 2023 season. I got essentially about 50% of the people to renew. And I think that's pretty good because, Mm -hmm. you know, most of these people had never done CSA before. And also lots of people told me that they're going to sign up anyways. And I've been seeing that over the course of the off season. Yeah. So especially to get them to renew that early. Before yes, you were... exactly. Yeah. Exactly. What is your what is your season run? Remind me when are when are you growing? M- middle of June is our first CSA delivery, all the way to middle of October. So I mean, I think it's basically the same thing as you. Okay. Yeah, and so the important part is, what would I do if I go back to zero, year zero? Like, how would I change things? I think two really important guiding principles. One is an abundance mindset. When you start farming, all of a sudden you're thinking about scarcity, you're thinking about your spending, and no one is attracted to that. You want to attract customers and employees that, you know, are excited about the farm and you have to exude that excitement as well. The other thing is you want to crawl, then you want to walk, then you want to run. And, you know, it took everything that I had not to try and do multiple projects on the farm at once. I still think I probably tried to do too much, but you know, you want to get chickens and you want to start doing eggs and you want to do uh, everything. Uh, so just pick something that you feel you're going to be really good at. And then, and for me, it was the vegetables. So before you get your farm, number one, read story brand. <laughs> Corinna talks about this. You got to build your brand script. Don't make yourself the hero. I could have called my farm the carbon farm. You know, I'm farming carbon and no one have been by by any of my, <laughs> you know, nice veggies, never mind my radishes. And then uh, the next thing is to build your business plan. So you need to look at your business opportunity. You need to lay out a budget, figure out all the expenses that you're going to have. And then also not just for the farm, but also your personal living expenses. And then make sure that your most conservative income forecast is aligned so that you are going to cover your living expenses. Because like I said, you know, I feel like we've been very aggressive in terms of building revenue, but there's so many expenses on the farm. Like it's just mind blowing. Every day you're going to the hardware store, spending hundreds of dollars on things. You need to make sure that you are not, you know, leaving your job until you really have that plan in place. And what I wanted to do to help other farmers is I've actually made my business plan into a template because, you know, it was hard for me to find one out of the gate. Luckily, I came across a farmer who shared theirs and I've evolved it. So I've put it on my blog at Mm coldspringsorganics.com. And so people can go there and download it and they can use my as a template. Uh, So step three, I would sign up for the newsletters of all the other farmers in your area and try to meet them if you can. Going back to that abundance mindset, like I find farmers are the best for this. You wouldn't go from, you know, one gym to a neighboring gym in in the city and find that the gyms want to share best practices with, with each other and things like this. But farmers are very happy to share by and large. And 
uh, if you get to know them, then you can help one another in your business. I have a great example that's come up in the last few weeks. A farm that we were back when, you know, uh, Grace was born, we joined a CSA right away and we were members of a CSA for five years. And, you know, I'm still on their newsletter and they emailed the other day saying that they're pausing their CSA and they have by far the biggest CSA base in this area. And so I reached out to her and I said, really sorry to hear that you're pausing your CSA. And I told her my story about how it part of what she did inspired us to start our own CSA farm. And now she's going to interview me and, uh, you know, let her members know. So, you know, there's going to be all these people that are looking for CSA shares. And so those are the kinds of things that can come up if you have relationships with other farmers. And not to mention, you get good ideas from the other farmers about, you know, things that they're sharing on their emails. So I would definitely do that. So step four, name your business by your domain name. So you want something that's going to be really memorable for your mm -hmm. customers and relevant for your brand script. Uh, this is where chat GPT comes in. So Corinna and I have talked a bit about this. Basically, it's like Google on steroids, if you haven't heard of it. The problem with the internet these days is that we're drowning in data and starved for information. So chat GPT is a really useful tool for example, when you're brainstorming farm business names, you can tell it, you know, re write your brand script to it and ask it for 10 suggestions for farm names. And it'll pick farm names that are in the theme. And it's just useful as a brainstorming tool. You know, you don't want to just rely on it 100%. For example, when I wanted to uh, revise my employment contract this year, I wanted to include a diversity and inclusion policy. I tried Googling stuff. And you get uh, so many companies that want to help you write it, but you don't get, you know, good verbiage that you can just copy and paste into your contract. And ChatGPT just basically wrote it for me. I reviewed it and I included it in my employment contract. It saved me, you know, at least an hour or a couple of hours. Yeah. Uh, so, and that's, that's an AI tool for everyone who's um, exactly. trying to like catch up with what, what ChatGPT is. You can just Google it, you know, and, and it'll take you to the page and it's free. As of right now, yes. it's open source software, right? Um, yeah, super powerful. Yes, uh, what, what else are you using that for? Are those the, the Yeah, you can use it for mm -hmm. so many things. Like, for example, when you want to come up with an idea for a Instagram post and you want a tagline, again, I've got a chat going with it where it knows my brand script and it knows all my things. And I say, okay, give me an example of a tagline I can use that would appeal to new New Year's resolutioners and things like that, right? Mm -hmm. And it'll give you ideas and then you can spin off of that. Another really good one uh, I've been using it for is I've laid out my 18 week crop plan. And so I ask it to give me suggestions for recipes for the week of every mm -hmm. single week ahead of time. So I'm going into the plan, assuming things stay on target with a whole bunch of recipes already pre-prepared. The last one I think is really useful is to get it to write your standard operating procedures. So it's it's really good for these things. I wouldn't get it to write my emails for me. I wouldn't get it to write my blogs for me, but I would use it to brainstorm around ideas for those things. You know, the emails and the blog, it just doesn't use like natural language the way I would talk. Uh, you know, I prefer to do those things myself. So getting back to, you know, using it to get your business name, if you use it to help you brainstorm names and then you use a tool like Bluehost uh, to check the domain availability, because you want to make sure you're going to get that URL, that preferred URL that you want. Uh, at the same time, I would check to see that the Instagram handle is available that you want. And then another useful tool is trends.google.com because you want to consider SEO. So for mm -hmm. example, you might want to have farms in your name so that when people Google farms near me or organics in your name or CSA in your name, you don't want your name to be too long. Ideally, it would end in .com. And uh, geez, I wish I knew more about SEO. If there's an SEO expert that listens to this podcast and wants to help me out, I would love to hear from you, especially if you're interested in trading, consulting from a two-year <laughs> farmer for SEO, because I am struggling with it. But anyways. And it's yes. such, it is an important part in the early stages of your business too, because you're trying to do that attraction work, right? You're trying to find the customer and- so SEO is largely helpful in that stage. So yeah, um, you know about the podcast, the local SEO yes, tactics yes. podcast. Their earlier episodes are super, super good. I always tell people to go there. So that's kind of a I, place to get the basics. 
Yes, I've kind of I've done the basics, but I want to, you know, fast track my way up the list. I'm yeah. slowly climbing the list, but I'm not climbing it as fast as I want to. Today's episode is sponsored by my CSA Membership Academy, your ready-to-go online content source to help your CSA members thrive. Get your first month for only a dollar when you use my coupon code TRIAL. Visit mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash academy to get started. When you join my CSA Membership Academy, you'll gain access to six modules of my CSA Farms curated selection of member support resources, how-to cheat sheets and guides, what to teach those CSA first years, cooking templates for all the basic meal formulas, my video cooking tutorials, ready for you to use and implement whenever you need them, as long as your subscription in the Academy is active. Each lesson contains either a PDF guide, an infographic, a video, a cheat sheet, or a recipe collection. And as a member of the Academy, you can use them as a jumping off point to make your own educational content to help your CSA members get the most out of their season. Get your first month for only a dollar when you use the coupon code TRIAL, T-R-I-A-L. To learn more, visit mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash academy to get started. And now back to the show. So the next thing, step five, get a logo and get your website set up. So fiverr.com is a great place to get a quick and inexpensive logo. Get something very simple. Remember, it's for the customer. It's not for you. Just keep it really simple. I want to mention my farmer friends here, Kieran and Tessa. They have a website design company called dibblerdesign.com. And on the website front, I do think that it's worth investing in getting someone who's an expert to help you get your website set up because you want something that looks professional. And man, it makes a big difference when you get people like uh, Kieran and Tessa on because they just they just really help it out. I would get a professional photographer. Maybe you can swap it for some of your farm's produce. You want to take pictures of the farmer and the farm family. That's at a minimum before you get your farm, you need those photos. I think the rest can be stock photos uh, out of the gate. And then you have to write a great about us story uh, because people want to know your farmer. Like yeah. Corinna, you've been on this for ages. That's the number one avatar of your ideal customer is people that want to know their farmer. And so you have to tell your story so that they feel like they know you. On that website, you also have to make it really easy for people to subscribe to your newsletter. Don't do what Glenn did. I waited until year two before I really made a concerted effort trying to collect uh, email addresses. Get that started before you even get your farm, before you even start your farm. And if you've started your farm and you haven't started your email list, start immediately. Stop the podcast. Get started. <laughs> <laughs> can I can I stop you for a second? Yeah, I want to yeah. go back to your photographer point. Um, yes. Now that you've done this for two years, what are some of the other photos that you wish you had collected along the way in the season to kind of help you market later? I have that exact plan, but it only happens once you actually get your farm. So these are all the things that I should have done before I got my farm. Oh, gotcha. But okay. I could fast forward if you want. No, 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 no. I, could... okay, I didn't okay. know you had, you got oh, crazy yeah, yeah, notes, yeah. man. Let's Miranda, go. I mean, all right, we'll me. get there. I'm just, I go we'll get there on these things. That's what I do. <laughs> no, I love right. it. Okay, keep going. Go through your list. Okay, so next you're going to set yourself up with a domain email address. So your email address uh, is going to be dot sharedlegacyfarms.com. You're going to get yourself a Google account and you're going to set up Gmail so that you can receive and forward emails from the domain email. Then you're going to set up Google Analytics. Again, before you even bought your farm, you're going to get your website up and you're going to know who's coming to your website and how they're getting to your website so that you have that information as you evolve. Uh, you're going to get your Instagram account. You're going to get your Facebook account. It's going to be at Cold Springs Organics or whatever your farm name is. Uh, set up your Google Drive and store everything there for the business in one place. You're going to buy Corinna's A to Z Vegetable Storage Guide, <laughs> and then you're going to use it to start collecting email addresses. <laughs> I did it not tell him some. to say that. No, 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 oh, don't worry. She, uh, honestly, the side point is that I'm a huge fan of Corinna's, and she, she, uh, all of this stuff has helped me tremendously. And so I think that you should do the same thing that I did where it's been so helpful. So 
right away start sending your emails and tie the message to your brand script. So going back to the point about, you know, I always want to write emails about how small farms help the environment and things like that, but I have to constantly remind myself that I'm trying to help transform people's relationship with food. I want to, I can share stories about the farm. I can share stories about how they can use their vegetables. Like that's the stuff that I should be writing more often. The other thing, and I leaned hard into this, is get in front of the camera and start posting regularly on Instagram and Facebook with transcripts turned on. People want to know your story. So you just, you know, you anything, there's anything interesting happening on the farm or even in your preparation. You're, you haven't even bought the farm. You're just looking at properties. Like stare, share those stories with people. People want to look at Clarkson's farm. Like people want to mm -hmm. watch these stories and learn about what you're doing and they get to live vicariously through you. So, you know, somebody called me Farmer Glenn early on and I've just like adopted that. Like everyone calls me Farmer Glenn now. And it's like, you know, so, so I think that you should really lean into that. As soon as you do know the location, say you're leasing a property or you're buying a place, right away, get your Google My Business account and update it regularly, post pics to it. It takes time to climb that ladder. So you wanna get that as soon as possible. Now, season one, you're going to have a central theme. So the idea here is that, you know, if you imagine the guy, the old spice commercial guy, right, he's coming out of the shower, he's got his towel on, and he's like making uh, minute rice in 10 seconds, and everyone's <laughs> ooing and aahing about him and stuff. And he's in this fancy house, and it's not even his house, right? It's like, th this is the theme, the theme in your first season is that don't do a CSA. What you're gonna do is you're gonna do a commercial for a CSA. So let's say you make your crop plan. You don't have to have an 18 week crop plan. You should have like a crop plan that peaks for four to six weeks and it's gonna be outstanding. You're gonna pick 12 customers, 12 of your favorite friends, customers, people who you know are big fans of you already, people who are active on social media, you know, maybe a, a foodie or two would be awesome who are really good at creating beautiful food with vegetables and other things. These people are going to be your rainmakers. OK, so they're mm -hmm. going to be the ones that will tell everyone about what you're doing and how cool it is. Uh, now, going back to the crop plan. You, I, what I would do is I would start with my year two promotions calendar and I would work backwards. So in year two, I'm going to start my CSA. In my CSA, I need to have all these pictures, right? So now in those pictures, I'm now picturing what are my Instagram worthy vignettes? Like what is a bin look like? It's got to have all the colors of the rainbow. It's got to have variety. It's got to have really popular, recognizable items. The other thing I would do, so this is coming to your point about what pictures we should include. Uh, the other thing I would do is I would have at least one on-farm event uh, that allows pictures of the gardens at their peak beauty, bringing customers in, enjoying the farm, getting pictures of kids grabbing cucumbers off of the vine and eating them right there in the fields. Uh, I would have a barbecue with some of the produce from the farm and pictures of people eating at the farm and having a good time. So, you know, if you think about that, it's more like a commercial. Your season one is more like your commercial for season two. Uh, you can still get sales out of it, but the key is going to be those vignette, those Instagram worthy vignettes and what photos you come out of season one with. I'd also hmm. get testimonials and get a professional for photos of your happy customers getting your best bins, you know, so you've got these beautiful rainbow bins and you're handing them over to your customers, you're in your Farmer Glen outfit or whatever it is. And, you know, the pictures that you have on your website where the person, your member is cooking with the food, like I still have to do that, but I love that. It's mm -hmm. like now you can cycle that through on your website. On the income front, so you're not starting a CSA here, but you're practicing it. So before you sell anything, don't make the mistake that I did. Get Square and QuickBooks. Do not integrate them, but make sure you understand end-to-end -end how a transaction will come in, how you'll invoice the customer, how you'll mark a sales receipt, and how you'll transfer information from Square into QuickBooks without making a mess. I connected them thinking that it would be fine. I'll clean it up later absolute nightmare. So uh, <laughs> learn from my mistake there. <laughs> okay, 
So we're still in season one. We're going to have a harvest schedule and we're going to have a communications plan. So we've got those 12 customers. We're going to harvest on Wednesdays. We're going to communicate to our customers. So don't do what I did. It's not ad hoc. It's it's repeating throughout those four to six weeks, you know, and you're just going to really make hay in that time that your crops are peaking. I do think it's worth going to a farmer's market if you have one in your area, even for those four to six weeks, you know, just as a per diem, like a, a drop in person rather than a person that's committing to the whole season. Uh, and because you're just going to get a ton of visibility, especially if they have a lot of Instagram followers or if they have an email list or something like that. So I think just doing part time at a farmer's market in your first season uh, would be a smart move as well. Yeah. And realizing that that's an investment of time, you know, that you may not bring in the revenue like you wish, but totally. but it, it it has a payoff later on, right? The ROI is is maybe a few years away. Hundred yeah. percent. And I would just talk to as many people as possible. I'd come to that farmer's market with extra people so that they can sell and I can just talk with talk with people and try to get as many relationships every day I go to farmer's market as I as I can. Mm -hmm. Then season two, sign up for Corinna's CSA Quick Start. She didn't pay me to tell you that, but you <laughs> need somebody to tell you what to do. Okay. So you're going to make a promotion calendar and you're going to map out your year two vignettes. So again, your promotion calendar is going to say from the start to the end, here are all the photos I'm going to get. Number one, every single bin, you're going to have great photos of it and great videos of it so that you can share that in all different places when you come around to year three or your second year of full CSA. Mm -hmm. I would get local line or another uh, web store and integrate it to your website. I also think that nowadays you have to get Square or something like it because whether you're at farmer's market or selling online, people just wanna use credit card. So yep. you just have to bite the bullet on that. I would make sure that every bin has a lot of color and at least one to two items that can be eaten without preparation. I didn't do a good enough job on that, uh, but I definitely am resolving that this year. The private Facebook group to build community, I think is key. You know, less people are using Facebook these days, but still there's people who use it really regularly and they get other people fired up. So hopefully in your customers in, in your first year of CSA, you have a handful of people that can just keep the engine going uh, on mm -hmm. the Facebook posts. They're sharing their stuff. You know, you've said this before, Corinna, there's like the barbecue person. There's, I've got the breakfast person, like he's constantly sharing his breakfast omelets and everyone's like, mm -hmm. you know what, I'll have a vegetable omelet for breakfast. Like yeah. these kinds of people really keep the Facebook engine going. And you um, get, and you get content from them too, right? I mean, you can get totally. permission to use their user generated content. You can post it and that drives social proof. So yeah, that I think it's worth it just for that. Yeah, hundred percent. I was hesitant to do it because I didn't think I would have enough members, but you know what? Uh, I came from the CrossFit community and uh, I saw how that really helps build that community. Mm -hmm. So I did it and I was very glad that I did. It's very quiet right now in there, but yeah. it's going to pick up, you know, over the course of the season again. Yeah. Yeah. I also, I traded bins with uh, two holistic nutritionists. So get a holistic nutritionist or a dietitian to do unboxing videos. I think that's definitely uh, something we have to do these days to help people with CSA. You know, most of the people that sign up for CSA are not used to cooking with a lot of vegetables and we want to make it as easy as possible for them to cook from scratch. Uh, mm -hmm. So the videos are going to be uh, showing them what's in the box, but also saying what to eat first and what lasts longer in the fridge and how to store things and giving some recipe ideas. Um, and, you know, it cost me nothing because I traded bins for it. So you could say it cost me something, but uh, I think it's a good investment. Um, the other thing in year two, you have to really be collecting testimonials at every opportunity. Uh, we do it at farmer's market. We do it at pickups. Um, and just interview the customers. Again, get used to turning on your phone. When somebody says something cool, you turn on your phone and you say, tell me again about how good our cherry tomatoes are. These cherry tomatoes seem like they've come from heaven. Like I had actual customers say that. And it's like, you know, every opportunity like that, you got to think, okay, I'm taking my phone out. Are you doing a, are you doing a video and just yes. saving it somewhere? Okay. Got it. Instagram live. If I, you know, if I really yeah. feel brave. <laughs> yeah. I love it. 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, so then the other thing is to look for opportunities to cross promote with other businesses. So especially mm -hmm. ones that have big Instagram presences. Uh, so Coburg Farmers Market for me is a big one. We have a local vineyard called 1840. We've done some stuff with and they get into that, too. Like everyone's like, yeah, let's you know, let's do Instagram together. Um, and then, like I said before, uh, I found the early bird course really helpful. I'm definitely going to repeat that process every year at the end of the season. You know, the, the right when the bins are at their peak late in the season, the week before, get everyone fired up with the giveaway week and all that stuff. And everybody's like really paying close attention and then, you know, le lean into your to your renewal. So mm -hmm. that is what I would do if I were to do it over again from year zero. You know, I love how what you're essentially describing is, is well, you've just shared your learning curve. So now you can see that this is what you should do. But you're you're looking at that second year as like, this is the year when I need to gather the marketing assets that I can use for the future, right? And that doesn't always occur to people to, to, to use that time in that way because you can repurpose them, right? We're always trying to make new stuff on the fly live when in reality yes. we can be posting things I was just doing this this morning. I was going through Google Photos to try and find a certain picture for my plant sale. And as I'm going through the pictures of last year, I'm like, oh my gosh, I, I should just be reposting some of this stuff from the summer right now to be promoting my CSA. Like there is so much good stuff in here and it doesn't have to be like right now, I just took this photo today, right? We can be using stuff from the past. So you're kind of helping people see here are the assets that you should be creating get get a certain type these certain types of photos collect testimonials right like what are those processes that that you should be doing in the marketing space right now i love that yeah Can, i mean sorry go ahead no finish your thought i was just gonna say like you know again if i could go back and start over that that thinking about the first year as a commercial for the second year i think would have been so helpful for me because it would have taken a lot of the pressure off, you know, and, and I just would have had a strategy. Like mm -hmm. that's a good solid strategy where I just did it. A, you know, I was trying to do everything at once, I guess. Yeah. So when you say that to, to think of it as a commercial, would you say that that's the priority over being profitable? Is that kind of what you're saying? Like, definitely. I mean, I, yeah. well, I, I wasn't going to be profitable in my first year. You no knew that already. What. 100%. Right. Uh, but what I did know is that I have to grow as fast as possible to get to that profitability. And to do that, I need the sales and marketing engine to be revved up. So mm -hmm. if you have to take, you know, growing the growing the vegetables, I didn't realize was going to be the easy part, like selling the vegetables, the radish analogy is worth its weight in gold. It's like, that is difficult. So mm -hmm. the starting it and and um we haven't really talked about it yet but uh you know there's all the instagram uh visibility you get and things like that but your customers i think that are going to stick around the longest and big the be the biggest fans are going to be the ones that are almost like a slow burn you're going to have to earn them over time it's probably going to be face-to-face -face conversations multiple times before they sign up and then they're going to stick around with you for years, right? And so um, I think that it, you just have to recognize that the sooner you start to get the momentum on the sales and marketing engine, the sooner you're going to start to get those customers trickling in and getting your awareness out there. Yeah. And so it's definitely worth the time to put the focus on that side. Um, and I think most people that get into farming, they're already really good at growing. Um, but you know, if they're like me, they're not good at sales and marketing. And so, geez, like it takes extra effort to get that mm -hmm. going. Yeah, I like that word slow burn, especially with a CSA. There is a long sales cycle for a CSA, especially. And you've got to honor that. You can't just expect to find all these super fans right away. It just doesn't, it just exactly. doesn't work that way. Yes. So what types of clients are you attracting, Glenn? Do you see any patterns? Like what are they valuing? Yeah, I mean, so the customers, I would say I have uh, three ideal customer avatars. There's the know your customer or know your farmer uh, customer. 
who, you know, just really values having a local farmer. And they're like, if we don't support our local farmers, then we're not going to have local farmers. And so mm -hmm. uh, that there's that one. There's the foodie, right? The people who want the freshest stuff, the really interesting stuff, you know, they share all their, their creations on social media or else they love having dinner parties and show off all the really good food that they make. And then the third one is the person that is uh, really concerned about, you know, we're organic. And so they're really concerned about the toxins and they want to make sure that they can trust where they're getting their food from. And so, you know, it helps for them to know their farmer and to be able to ask questions about your methods and things like that. So those are, are the three main buckets, I would say. And do you find that as a result, you are, you are using your marketing is talking to those three people? I mean, are you sort of shifting your voice from time to time so that they're all sort of getting hit? Yes, a little bit. I mean, I think I think that I try to hit on the get in front of the camera as much as possible so people know their farmer because it's going to appeal to all three of those. Um, and, you know, I guess I try to talk about all three of the um, or messages that appeal to all three of them. Um, mm -hmm. But I wouldn't say that I figured out, you know, the keystone for it yet. I'm mm -hmm. still working it out. Yeah. Yeah. You have so much energy behind you. I don't know if you hear that from a lot of people, but you're like this big ball of energy. You use the the word earlier to to come from a place of abundance. And I feel like you probably attract people into your brand just because you are you are just giving that off even in your marketing. Um would you say that right now at least you are sort of the charismatic leader, the the charismatic figure in the brand that's that's drawing people to you? Are you the primary per person on the camera that's? Yes. Okay. Yeah, like I said, last year I had the social media lead who did a really mm -hmm. good job. Like she would get on the camera. She would put other members of the, uh, of the team on the camera. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would regularly do the camera too, because I just found like, I don't think you can really do too much of that. Like people want to learn about the what you're doing. Yeah. They, so, uh, but yeah, I mean one of the biggest challenges I found with farming, which I didn't appreciate what, uh, uh, at the outset was it's a seasonal work. So last year I worked hard in the off season, found my team, hired them. And then at the end of this season, now they're going off in three different directions and now I'm starting over again. Right. Mm -hmm. So I kind of, at the moment, I kind of have to be the person yeah. who's the, yeah. who's the core. Yeah. And I'm not being critical of that. I think that that's actually really normal for kind of stage one of a business that it is very character driven or, or personality driven by, by the founder in many cases. And then as you scale, you will, you will begin to see that you, you can step out of that and become kind of the CEO of the business and create other people who are uh, in charge of that particular job, right? That, that becomes their their purpose. You're still in there, yeah. but maybe yeah. you're not the one that's like responsible for the metrics and the ultimate yes. goals. And you, you can really give that to someone else to, to champion and run with it. Yes. I'm looking yeah. forward to having more of a team and I've hired somebody again yeah. for this season who I think is going to be a good fit for that. So, yeah. you know, uh, without getting ahead of myself, I'm feeling good about yeah. the runway, but yeah. Yeah. Can we, so this was a question I wanted to ask really early on when you started talking um, how, when you, when you talked about the, the early, before you even got the farm, you were coming up with a business plan and you were, um, hiring a consultant and visiting with a organic certification person and just getting all that, all your ducks in a row. Like you really came in with a mission. And so that when you actually started things, you could hit the ground running. Yes. Um, how are you affording that? So you said you have a silent partner. Like I'm yeah. thinking, you know, what is where is the money coming from so that you can even do that? Can you talk a little bit about that challenge? Yeah. So, uh, you know, first of all, I'm not young. I'm in my late 40s. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I went into engineering and, you know, put my head down working in IT and stuff, I, I was, you know, coming from sort of a moderate country uh, family income and mm -hmm. was definitely motivated to make some money. So I worked very hard. To, you know, I was a manager by the time I was 25. I was a director a few years later. I had a big organization. Yeah. And, you know, I, I luckily, I figured out early that stocks were not where it was at and real estate investing was where it was at. And so I started 
building my real estate investment for portfolio. Um, and so uh, over time, that was before everyone was investing in real estate. Over time, you know, I managed to save up some money. And um, and also, as I mentioned earlier, I have the friend who's, uh, you know, a silent partner. And certainly mm -hmm. without him, there's no way we would have been able to take this approach. Um, yeah. We would have had to do something totally different. So, yeah, that's that those are the big keys, I would say, like, you know, when we decided to purchase the farm, I sold a bunch of the real estate holdings and now I've spent it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's, you know, my, my life is a slightly different story, but my husband worked the first five years full time somewhere else. Um, as we essentially built the infrastructure of the farm and worked through some of these key elements and got, you know, poured everything back into the business. Um, yes. So, you know, that is, I guess, you know, what you're describing is that this was not just a decision, oh, I want to be a farmer. And then, you know, you have to figure out how to pay for everything and try to make a living like you, you were a little bit methodical about, well, I, this is what I'm going to need to do first. I need to, you know, invest in, in X, Y, Z, these first few things before I even jump in. And you had the means to do that because you had taken the time to plan for that. So Right. I think that is definitely um, something everyone should kind of consider before they just leave their job and decide to go and farm. Um, yeah. But, I mean, that's why I mentioned the business plan, like really yeah. laying out, like, I mean, even before you start to business plan, hopefully you have a really yeah. clear understanding for your monthly expenses and stuff, right? Like yeah. anyone can do that. Yeah. Do you, do you have a, when you set the cell up, you and your partner, did you sort of have a drop dead date? Like if we don't, get to this number by this day, like we're out or what is that? We never that said like? like, okay, we're going to be out if we don't hit this number by this date. But um, I definitely, I'm feeling the pressure to this season to break even. I mean, yeah. that's, that's really important. I mean, and part of it is just, uh, you know, going back to my mission about the one farm for every hundred families, mm -hmm. I have to figure out how this can be done. This has mm -hmm. to be done. Like, mm -hmm. and I want to share it with other people too, because, um, you know, it gives me hope to be out yeah. there in the fields with the birds and the, and, you know, and my hands in the soil. And uh, I want other people to feel that. I want us to build communities around the farms. I want us to, you know, reduce our carbon footprint and uh, it, so I'm really driven to actually seeing this be successful and, and I'm happy to share it with others. If, mm -hmm. you know, people want to chat with me, they can email me at coldspringsorganics at gmail.com. And I'd be happy to share it with others because, you know, like I say, um, this really has to work. I have to yeah. figure out how to, how to make this work. Yeah. You have kind of shared, as you shared that whole story over the last few years, I feel like you gave us little nuggets of um how the marketing journey works for a typical customer but can you try to yeah. succinctly describe like what is the the marketing funnel as you understand it as you're trying to move people through it where do people start what's the next step and then the next one you know what i'm talking about we teach this in accelerator yeah how does that work of course i do so this was the first project we worked on accelerator which was a mm -hmm. sales funnel um so the um the first thing is word of mouth. I would say um, don't underestimate that. The friends and family um, and getting friends and family to talk to their friends and family and so on and so forth. Uh, one interesting thing for me is uh, for you know the better part of the last 10 years, I was a part-time coach at a CrossFit gym and personal trainer. Mm. Um, and so about maybe 30% of my customers were from my CrossFit Pickering community. Um, and I'm actually started uh, coaching at a different gym in Scarborough called CrossFit Canuck. And I'm meeting new people as well who are now signing up for the farm. So, um, you know, I, I would say word of mouth is big. And, you know, I think without being annoying, you kind of have to bring it up in many conversations. So every time you're talking to somebody, drop that you're a farmer and or veggie box subscriptions or whatever you sell, um, just, you know, not in your face, but I think that you got to throw a lot of lines in the water, right? Mm -hmm. um, then there's farmer's market. The farmer's market, like I said, has been a big boon for yeah. us. Uh, Instagram, you know, uh, 
that's been uh, an area where people find out about us. And even this year, like I've got in the next uh, couple of weeks, I've got a few public speaking events. I'm speaking at a Rotary Club this week. Mm -hmm. I'm speaking at a horticultural society um, meeting. And uh, so I'm just basically I'm trying to meet as many people as possible yeah. who might know people who want to be uh, members of the farm. Um, so are then, you are you talking about the far, the CSA at the farmers market? Like, is it evident yeah. that you sell that? OK, yes. Okay. Yes. And, and actually, it's a great point. It's one of the things I came up with from our sales funnel activity was to do it even better to almost like every single customer walks away knowing that we do CSA. It's not that I want to drive down the farmer's market uh, because I think they're different customers to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. um, but I do want to just raise awareness about our CSA. Yeah. So basically we are front end is, is all of that stuff. And, and people usually end up following our Instagram. Uh, and then that, and then eventually it leads them to our website. When you go on our website, you're there for five seconds, you get the lead magnet, A to Z vegetable storage guide. Uh, we talked in sales funnel. I have a few ideas for trying different lead magnets as well. And once you subscribe, you get the email drip sequence. So, you know, an email right away to welcome you, telling our story, so on and so forth. And hopefully by the end of that sequence, now you're primed to try, for example, our four-week sampler. And so it kind of culminates in getting people to try the CSA. Once you try it, we have the onboarding emails that give you the CSA uh, quick start uh, guide that bring you into our private Facebook group. Uh, we do a little dance, all of that, that stuff. And, uh, <laughs> and then once you're in there, then you see the holistic nutritionist doing the unboxing videos. You see people talking about, Hey, you know, my kid ate such and such vegetable or whatever. And things, uh, you see pictures of, I've got one foodie in our group. She posts all the time. And everybody's like, I almost feel like she's too good. Like she posts pictures and then nobody else wants to post their pictures. Yeah, because they're hers intimidated. Is so good. Yeah. Exactly. It's like, well, who can compete with Lisa? Uh, and then uh, we did the giveaway week at the peak season leading into the early bird renewals. And then um, I'm hoping that people re renew and then just advocate for us. So I send emails from time to time uh, suggesting how they might, you know, build more referrals for us. So that's kind of the sales funnel in, in a nutshell. I have a bunch of ideas uh, for things that I want to do that came out of our act exercise, which we can get into if you want. Yeah. So let, let's go there. Let's, let's talk okay. about what, yeah. What other innovations you've thought of or other things you want to try? Yes. So one of the things is that I feel like we leaned a little bit too much just on Instagram and I feel like we get more traction on in-person stuff. So I've been spending more time in person, like that CrossFit coaching is definitely mm -hmm. a boon. Um, and, uh, We've been making flyers on Canva. Uh, I've been dropping those in our health food stores, uh, healthcare professionals' offices, mm -hmm. you know, chiropractors, doctors, physios, massage therapists. Uh, I even, my son and I even put them on windshields of cars in, in a gym parking lot uh, just after New Year's, mm -hmm. um, you know, just trying something, right? And mm -hmm. it's interesting because all of a sudden I was getting alerts from Google saying that my website had hit a traffic all time high. Um, the uh, the the one other thing we're doing is we're doing a handout uh, that's how to store veggies. And so I'm hoping people will put it up on their fridges. It says Cold Springs Organics at the top. You know, it tells them how to store all the different veggies. Um, and, uh, and if it shows up on people's fridges, neighbors come over, they see that, maybe it sparks a conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so the in-person stuff, I'm also doing those speaking events and the CrossFit. Uh, the other thing that I've done a little bit on at a time uh, is the SEO. So I'm just scratching the surface. I'm trying to get as many quality links to my website as possible, like Coburg Farmers Market, Regen Canada, um, you know, the, the local regional sites that promote um, local food. So I'm slowly moving up the list. I did that, you know, the SEO Intrix uh, audit Mm -hmm. right away. And then I can see every time I redo that audit, you know, I'm doing a little bit better in my mm -hmm. score. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Um, I mentioned the refrigerated trailer and the big stickers on it. Uh, but what I didn't mention is we have these really cool uh, yellow bins that we use for our veggies. And they're the ones that have the closable top. So they look really clean and professional. They've got a sticker on it. It says Cold Springs Organics. Let us be your farmer. Uh-huh. Uh, and it's even got the QR code on it. Um, for them to leave a review. And so when we do our pickups, you know, every other week I have somebody walk over. It's like, I've seen these people every, every week with these yellow bins walking around the neighborhood and like, what are you guys doing? So yeah, yeah. that was, that was, uh, uh, I guess, uh, made me happy because I was yeah. hoping that would happen. The bin, the bin choice itself ends up being a marketing strategy. Exactly. The, the color yes. and yeah, that yes. stands out. Mm-hmm. And the fact that it's so clean and stuff, it's really easy mm-hmm. to clean. And so I, when I interviewed my customers at the end of last season, you know, a couple of people mentioned that it just like gives a really professional mm-hmm. feel to it. Like mm-hmm. um, yeah. another one that I think is worth, uh, is worth mentioning is um, the uh, doing the crop plan designed around a meal plan. So, uh, you know, here it's called Hello Fresh. There's other ones I'm sure in the States. And I, I, it's, we're not that far off from being able to do things that are one step better than kits. So last year we did a salsa kit, a baba ganoush kit, which is basically like a salsa kit is your cherry tomatoes, some romas, garlic, uh, mm-hmm. red onion, um, cilantro, you know, and a little bit of instruction on how to turn it into a nice fresh salsa. And everyone was like, I never made salsa before. It's so good. Um, so, I, so I think we can add to that uh, the soup mm-hmm. kit, a pickling kit, uh, a, a stock kit, mm-hmm. um, and also win- winter roasting veggie bundle right at the year mm-hmm. end. I think that might be an add-on that we sell, right? And get some yeah. extra revenue. Uh, mm-hmm. But over and above that, I think that we could get to the point where we're doing, you know, an actual meal plan. So it's like, we're not just providing you with all the, all the veggies to make this recipe, like we usually do with our weekly recipe emails, but now we can actually provide like meal plan kits. Um, So that's something I really think, especially when you look at younger people, they want things delivered to them. They want everything like sort of almost pre-prepared. So I think that we could take a big step in that direction. Um, I have a few other ideas, like a new lead magnet, five ways to sneak uh, veggies into your kids' diets. Mm -hmm. Um, I mentioned about farmer's market and doing a much better job of making sure that people walk away knowing, oh, they do CSA, I'm going to tell my aunt Shirley or whatever, you know? Right, right, right. Uh, Kayla from Accelerator, she was she had the background in doing the t-shirts and stuff. And so I've found a company that does... um, basically like pre-ordered t-shirts. So I'm meeting with them this afternoon so we can have a cool t-shirt and, you know, Mm -hmm. collect orders from everyone. And then Mm -hmm. like Kayla said, now all of a sudden people are walking around with your logo for your farm on their, on their t-shirt. And then the Mm -hmm. last one is a virtual farm tour. So we did a really cool drone video uh, over the course of last season. Uh, But what I'd like to do this season is do like a really professional virtual farm tour and use that to introduce people to the farm. The more people connect or connect with the farm, the better we're going to be. And it's just such a beautiful piece of property. Like I think that people will really fall in love to it. So those are some of the ideas for this, this season. Oh, I love it. Do you have a lot of customers coming out to visit throughout the season too, or are you too far away from Toronto? Not really. Okay. Uh, we have people that reach out, but it's... Um, That's not an expectation. No, it's not really an expectation uh, unless it's planned. Like, yeah. you know, we have our anniversary party yeah, and we need right. to do more things like that. At the end of last season, we did a, uh, with one of the farmer's market people, again, a good reason to do farmer's market. You get to meet these people. Uh, mm-hmm. I have a friend now who does... Uh, pizza wood oven pizzas and so he's got Mm -hmm. a whole farmer's market kit he brought it he set it up in the barn he made pizzas on the spot with stuff from the gardens they were to die for Mm -hmm. and uh he's like you should be doing this every week and i was Mm -hmm. like why am i not like the barn Mm -hmm. looks gorgeous you know with the little hanging lights and everything like that as soon as it gets dark it's just unbelievable and um you know again people just connect right yeah yeah um, okay, I have two le- two questions left before we're done. Okay. Um, so uh, this was not on the list of questions that I sent you to prepare. So let's see how you do Uh-oh. just off the top. Right. So you you mentioned that you're into CrossFit, that you are, are you actually a trainer there yes. or are you? Okay. And so I see 
a lot to be learned from the CrossFit community in terms of how to create healthy habits in a customer, right? Yeah. Uh, and how to create, and I guess the power of community to yes. help solidify that new lifestyle fitness habit in a new person at a gym. Um, what are some of the takeaways that, you know, what you know about how to change a person's habits? <laughs> what, yeah. You know, what, what can you take from that and like apply it to changing a person's eating habits around CSA? Okay, so yeah, I have lots of ideas around this. But the first one is, you know, in all my years being involved in health and fitness, it is it it is relatively easy to get people to exercise. It is hard to get them to eat right. And the sad thing is, is abs are made in the kitchen. So they mm -hmm. all want the results and they're willing to work hard. When they go to the gym, I mean, they're working hard but the thing is, is that they're not partnering it with a really good diet. And so, you know, I almost mentioned this in innovations. There's there's one part of, uh, you know, the CrossFit community, I guess, that is into this thing called the 800 gram challenge. And so the 800 gram challenge is to try to eat 800 grams of fruits and vegetables every day, which sounds like a lot. But every day for breakfast, I have a vegetable omelet and I put like 350 grams of vegetables in there. They count potatoes, they count fruit. So there's some heavier vegetables that you can get. If you were doing 800 grams of spinach, yes, nearly impossible. But uh, <laughs> for those veggies, it's totally doable. And the thing is, is when you start your day with a protein rich, big, you know, veggie scramble uh, like that, you're full all the way through the morning, you have no cravings because, you know, your blood sugar is nice and even. And, uh, you know, you basically get people halfway through their day with, you know, really good source of protein and really good bunch of vegetables and a nice diet. So I feel like if we could encourage people to eat those types of meals, like my my one Facebook uh, member who's constantly posting his veggie omelets, like if other people are catching on to that and being like, wow, you know, I feel full longer and I feel more energy and all of that by eating this breakfast, it sets me on the rails mm -hmm. for the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. So I would say that's one thing. And I, I just think if we could get customers to have two handfuls of veggies in every meal, it's going to displace processed food. It's going to make them feel more energized. It's going to make them eat less calories, which is going to give them results on the scale. Mm -hmm. So um, those are some of the things I would say are, uh, are lessons that I've learned from working with people. But no matter what, it is difficult to get people to eat right. You know, yeah. the, the treats and the fatty foods and stuff, you know, they're appealing because they're tasty and they're they're generally easy too. highly processed right. foods are so right. easy to grab. Well, and they're, they're in our food habits, right? Like, I just feel like our brain has already created like a pathway. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. So, but the habit, the healthy habits can displace them, you know, yeah. It, yeah. It, it, whenever, you know, I try at least 80% of the time to start my day with that omelet. And I always have the whole rest of the day is much healthier yeah. than yeah. if I start it with, you know, a bowl of cereal with blueberries or, I don't know, toast or something like that, you know, yeah. I go in the other direction if that yeah. happens. Yeah. Um, so that's one of the things. The other thing I would say is the community. So having events at the farm, getting people to know one another, you know, in those private Facebook groups, I would always try and like, even when I was coaching a class, I would say, do you guys know, uh, Deanne is a mortgage broker or whatever it is like, you know, people, people then can make connections and it actually helps their business. You know, I swear that we have like real estate agents that are members of the CrossFit gym just because they get to meet all these people, you know? So I think that we need to tap into that. Like we should have Rolodexes or something with people who have skills and experience like that to say, did you know, Corinne is a lawyer or whatever it is, you know, it's like, uh, taking advantage of that and giving people that visibility and that extra benefit. It's no skin off our backs. Mm -hmm. um, and it just helps build the community, helps people get to know one another yeah. uh, and get more benefits from other, apart from just the veggies. Yeah. And I, I think too, with gyms, like if you know, you're going in to see 
the same people every week, there's this accountability piece, right? So I think that's why something like CrossFit, because totally. because Katie, who's my community manager, she's in CrossFit and she's yes. just like bought in. And yes. I know it's because she's seeing these people, she's running races with them, right? There's now a, a sense of this is this is what it means to be Katie. I am a CrossFitter, right? And like, yeah, yeah, what would yeah. that look like for our businesses? Like, I am, you know, this is me. I'm Corinna. I am a CSA member. Like, this is yes. how I live, right? And we have to try and cultivate that that community identity as well. Yes, so. I mean, we have to have on farm events. We have to get people to meet meet face to face, or yeah. or make make a big deal of your pickups and get people to meet face to face. Because, mm -hmm. you know, the CrossFit you're showing up at six a.m. every morning. You're working out with the same people. I mean, people practically have their own squares on the thing that they always go to, and mm -hmm. uh, so you know, it's 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 uh, you're you're sweating and you're bleeding with one another, and mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. it's it's hard to replicate that. But if we can get people out to the farm, if we can get people to meet one another they're still going to get a lot of benefit from that and everyone's craving community now like yeah, i mean yeah and we'd all do much better if we just had a bigger stronger healthier more vibrant community so yeah awesome i, what, I would say one other quick thing on it is yeah. we can also learn what not to do like you see so many crossfit gyms you go onto their website it's like a person you know clapping their hands with chalk and like rip no shirt on and like going really aggressive after the weights and it's like what you know what you there's there's 10 or 20 people who just want to get a good workout and be healthy and maybe lose weight for every one person who wants to go into a gym and be yeah. like slapping each other with chalk and that's not how most crossfit gyms are but yet that's what they put on their website so we have to do the same thing from the farming perspective like don't mm -hmm. put our websites just to appeal our own self we should try to appeal to our customers mm -hmm. uh, with what we put to on our websites I love that. Glenn, you've mentioned Accelerator a few times throughout today. Um, I'm actually not actively uh, promoting that right now. You can't even get into Accelerator until September when people are listening to this. This is dropping at the end of March. But um, can you try to describe to people, you know, what what Accelerator has meant for you, like what what it's done for you, what you've appreciated about it? Okay. It's funny because as you're talking, I'm like, well, then these people are going to be competing for spaces in Accelerator with me. And say, like, I'm not getting out of line. I'm staying on that. I'm staying on that bulletin board. On the no, they can get now. on the wait list. They can get on the wait list. <laughs> you're funny. All right. So I guess there are two main parts to Accelerator that, you know, uh, has come out of it. And one is. For example, we had the sales funnel, right? So you, you have you as an expert who's guiding us uh, as, you know, whatever level of experience we have through a, a robust process to help us uh, build a sales funnel and get to review it with one another and get input um, on it. And so, you know, you come out of that with a pretty clear sense of what the uh, plan should be and what are the actions that you need to take. Um, and the other part of it is now all of a sudden I know all these really successful farmers. Like I never would have expected when I started that I would be meeting with someone like Ann the other day who has an 800 member CSA. Like, so like just to me, it's just like, wow, like yeah. unbelievable, you know? So I think it, the opportunity is also what you make of it. It's a really mm -hmm. dynamic group, breadth of experiences. Everyone's so open to sharing, which I love. And, you know, what I've been doing is trying to reach out and meet them and have chats with them outside of the accelerator sessions, uh, because it's every time I have a conversation with someone like Tessa or anybody, you know, I just learning so much. Um, and I found it so hard to meet farmers when I first started farming. I just was like, you know, you try and Google them and you, you only find the people that buy ads and it's difficult to find the farmers. And so it's really nice to be able to find these people that have, you know, found so much success in farming and being so willing to share. Um, so I would say that uh, it's really fast tracked uh, my business. And I think uh, we, <laughs> we spend a lot of time doing things that are not uh, producing results. And so it's important to have a really good plan that's going to be focusing you on the tasks that'll get you a return on your time. Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, like I said earlier, it's like you only have so long before 
you need to be breaking even and you need to be making money. Um, so anything we can do to improve ourselves in the sales and marketing space, I think is critical. That was beautiful. Where, thank you. Thank you for saying that. It's, it's my favorite thing that I do right now. And I would agree that the value of the group is actually generated by the group itself, <laughs> um, by the, just the things that people are sharing and the, the experiences that all the, the different members bring to the group. It's made it so wonderful. Why don't you tell people where people can go and learn more about you or reach out to you to share their wonderful advice with you if they want to? <laughs> <laughs> yes, my SEO expert. I want you to email me at coldspringsorganics at gmail.com. Yeah, and uh, no, I mean, uh, I'm happy to share whatever I can share. And uh, so, yeah, reach out to me. I Again, uh, the website is www.coldspringsorganics.com. I've got a blog page there. I'm going to try and add stuff that'll support small scale farmers, but I started with the, uh, the business plan. Um, and also you can follow us on Instagram at cold springs organics. So we try to put up interesting stuff and, you know, even videos where we find little, uh, little tricks to improve our efficiencies and things like that. So, yeah, I see incredible things in your future. You are manifesting like crazy. So um, y'all should you. reach out to him and follow his website. All right. I'll put all that stuff in the show notes today. And thank you again for this awesome interview. And I, I have just, you've been one of the best things that's ever happened to me just meeting you. And Aww, thank you. Seriously. Cry. Like, seriously. <laughs> uh, I, I feel like um, I have become better at what I do because of your amazing questions and your support. So thanks for being on the show. Thank you, Corinna. Well, I hope you were as inspired and motivated by that interview as I was. Glenn is a huge ball of energy. And whenever I meet up with him in our group coaching sessions or our one-to-one -one calls, I come away with ideas and I just get even more jazzed about what we're doing here. Now, today's show notes can be found at mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash 204. And if you like today's episode, please go leave me a rating or a review on Apple Podcasts. You just have to scroll down past all the episodes and at the bottom, there's a section that says, leave a review, give me a five-star review or share your thoughts about the podcast. I'm trying to collect just a few more this quarter because it helps me get discovered by more farmers. And I don't do any advertising on other shows. This is all just word of mouth. So if you can help me with that, that would be awesome. Now, don't forget, if you want to get onto my email list, I have some free stuff to send your way to make your marketing even stronger. I get so many good comments from farms um, about that email sequence that I send out. So you can go subscribe at mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash subscribe to get on that list. And I'm also now on Instagram at my digital farmer. If you'd like to follow me there, I show up throughout the week with Instagram stories and some tips on what I'm working on and what I'm seeing working out in the farming world. I'd love to connect with you there. And I am also looking for podcast guests. So if you know of a farm that you would love to have featured on the show, or maybe you are that farmer and you have a really cool thing that you're doing, or you just want to tell your story and we can kind of audit your sales funnel and pick through it. I'd love to have you. I'd love to consider having you on the show. So please reach out to me. Corinna at mydigitalfarmer.com is my email address. That's C-O-R-I-N-N-A. Thanks for joining me today, you guys. Have a wonderful week and I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.